Now, Mr. Weller. Now, sir. I believe you're in the service of Mr. Pickwick, the defendant in this case. Speak up, if you please, Mr. Weller. I mean to speak up, sir. I am in the service of any gentleman, and a very good service it is, too. Little to do, and plenty to get, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, quite enough to get, sir. As the soldier said, that they ordered him 350 lashes. You must not tell us what the soldier said, unless the soldier is in court and is examined in the usual way. It's not evidence. Very good, my lord. Do you recollect anything particular happening on the morning when you were engaged by the defendant? Uh, yeah, I do, sir. Have the goodness to tell the jury what it was. I a regular new fit out of clothes that morning, gentlemen of the jury. And that were a very particular and uncommon circumstance with me in them days. You had better be careful, sir. The judge looked sternly at Sam, but Sam's features were so perfectly serene that the judge said nothing more. Do you mean to tell me, Mr. Weller, that you saw nothing of this fainting on the part of the plaintiff in the arms of the defendant, which you have heard described by the witnesses? Certainly not. I was in the passage till they called me up and that the old lady was not there. You were in the passage and yet saw nothing of what was going forward. Have you a pair of eyes? Mr. Weller? Yeah, I have a pair of eyes, sir, and that's just it. Maybe if I was a pair of Python double million magnifying gas microscopes extra power, perhaps then I might be able to see through two flights of stairs and a deal door. But, uh, being you know, the eyes, you see, my vision's limited. Now, oh, it's perfectly useless, my lord, attempting to get any evidence from the impenetrable stupidity of this witness. Stand down, sir! That's my uh, case, my lord. Sergeant Snubbin then addressed the jury on behalf of the defendant, and did the best he could for Mr. Pickwick, and, and the best as as everybody knows on the, on the uh, infallible, eh, eh, infallible authority of the old adage, could do no more. The judge summed up in the old established and most approved form. He read as much of his notes to the jury as he could decipher on so short a notice and made running comments on the evidence as he went along. If Mrs. Bartell were right, it was perfectly clear that Mr. Pickwick were wrong, and... If they thought the evidence of Mrs. Cluffins worthy of credence, they would believe it, and why, if they didn't, they, they wouldn't. The jury then retired to their private room to talk the matter over, and the judge retired to his private room to refresh himself with a mutton chop and a glass of sherry. An anxious quarter of an hour elapsed. The jury came back, the judge was fetched in. Mr. Pickwick put on his spectacles, and gazed at Dodson and Fogg. Gentlemen, are you all agreed upon your verdict? We are! Do you find for the plaintiff, gentlemen, or for the defendant? For the plaintiff! We have what damages, gentlemen? Seven hundred and fifty pounds! Gentlemen, said Mr. Pickwick, I have long been anxious to tell you, in plain terms, what my opinion of you is. Take care, sir, said Mr. Dodson, who, though he was the biggest man of the party, had prudently entrenched himself behind Fogg and was speaking over his head with a very pale face. Let him assault you, Mr. Fogg. Don't return it on any account. No, no, I won't return it, said Fogg, falling back a little more as he spoke, to the evident relief of his partner, who by these means was gradually getting into the outer office. You are, 
continued Mr. Pickwick, resuming the thread of his discourse, you are a well-matched pair of mean, rascally, petty fucking robbers. Well, is that all? It is all summed up in that. They are mean, rascally, petty fucking robbers. Well, my dear sirs, he has said all that he has to say. Now pray go. Is that door open? You are a couple of mean. If it's Lord in England, sir, you shall smart for this. Rascally! Remember, sir, you bloody daily poets! Petty fucking! Robbers! <gasps> Robbers! cried Mr. Pickwick, running to the stairhead as which a turn is descended. Robbers! shouted Mr. Pickwick, thrusting his head out of the staircase window! When Mr. Pickwick drew in his head again, his countenance was smiling and placid. He declared that he had now removed a great weight from his mind, and that he felt perfectly comfortable and happy. Having put on his hat with great nicety, Mr. Pickwick allowed himself to be assisted into a hackney coach, which had been fetched for the purpose by the ever-watchful Sam Weller. <laughs> you have it. Bardell and Pickwick. And no, before you ask, I didn't understand it either. Excellent use of hats, though. Must be commended on that score. There'll be a very short break now. Bear with us as we shuffle about in the dark, trip over the furniture, whip this a mat into some semblance of order, not to mention whipping our steadily dying actor into giving us another thirty minutes. Shan't be a moment, you know. All well worth it. Play, orchestra. Play! <laughs> item on the bill is drawn from Nicholas Nickleby, the novel in which I, my dear wife, all the little Crumbleses and the infant phenomenon appear. However, in one of those disappointing little twists of the knife of fate, I shan't actually be appearing in the next instalment. The title proper is Nicholas Nickleby at the Yorkshire School. So we'll be departing Dickens's established London for an altogether darker landscape. You certainly won't be getting me back to Yorkshire after what transpired on my last provincial tour. Something to do with a disagreeable sheep, a messy bowel condition, and what I assumed was a bowl of shaving cream. A tale bitter left, untold.